So thank you for inviting me here to Uppsala. I really enjoyed um, being here and talking to all of you. And um, as Jessica said, my name is Osa Bergen and I am from Lund University. And today I will be talking about the uh, changing archaeological documentation practices and uh, what consequences uh, these changes may have for our data. And what I mean with um, changing archaeological practices is mainly the shift from analog to digital tools and methods, and especially when it comes to documentation of archaeological remains. Uh, in archaeology, we have a long history with digital tools and digital methods. It starts actually in the 1950s. Um, but today I will be talking mainly about the digital tools that are used in uh, the field, during field work, to document the actual uh, remains. So the methods that were starting to be used, let's say, in the late 80s or uh, during the 1990s, um, when we started to have what may be uh, called a born digital data, um, or uh, documentation that was never manually um, constructed, but uh, digital from the start. And uh, we had total stations and, and uh, various kinds of software to um, work with that kind of data. So from the 1990s and on, the um, uh, development of, um, of uh, digital tools in archaeology has, has been quite uh, rapid. and uh, you can say that today, uh, digital tools and methods are uh, ubiquitous in, in, in all of archaeology, in all aspects of archaeology. Uh, but just um, as expected, when something is changing and new methods and tools are coming in, of course, this is uh, stirring up a debate uh, and discussions of what are the uh, gains uh, and what are the losses uh, when you uh, shift your methods? And that also happened, of course, in the 1990s. And as I uh, recall, uh, at least, uh, one of the more common arguments for using digital methods back then was that it was faster, it was a lot quicker, it saved time, which means it also saved money. Um, and on the other side, on the, on the other hand, uh, it was also discussed um, that uh, there was a loss of uh, the graphic record of uh, what could be a more flexible way of, of documenting, um, that uh, there was a loss of the uncertainty and, and the detail and the nuance of the, of the, um, the remains. Um, but whatever the... Um, uh, whatever your your opinion about this is, um, I guess you can uh, we can all agree on that digital tools have had a profound impact on archaeology. Um, this is stated over and over again. Uh, but what do we really mean uh, with this uh, profound impact? Because this impact varies depending on what you are talking about, what kind of uh, uh, what part of archaeology you're talking about. And I'll just give you a short overview of the impact of digital tools on the various phases of um, an archaeological investigation. And when it comes to the planning phase, the uh, when you are uh, deciding your your uh, and designing your research uh, questions, etc., the digital impact has been quite uh, uh, large, actually, uh, because uh, you have a lot of different kinds of um, information sources now coming from digital uh, methods. For example, when it comes to surveying and when it comes to detection in the form of uh, remote sensing and other non-destructive methods uh, can give you an idea uh, and, and you get you a, a lot of information uh, when you are starting to um, uh, plan uh, uh, an excavation. Also, big data, of course, gives you also a, a general uh, overview of a certain phenomenon. Uh, you can um, get a lot of information that way uh, with the digital infrastructures that are now being built, uh, etc. 
and uh, that also allows new research questions to be posed. So that so that's um, a really big impact. When it comes to field work, um, um, when it comes to the field work and the documentation part of field work, the digital impact is enormous. Uh, we have what I uh, just mentioned as born digital documentation, and this goes from every um, level of archaeology, from the single layer or single find to whole landscapes, and it can be um, uh, documented with born digital uh, data, with uh, geographical information systems and and three D documentation, etc. It's it's the sky is the limit here. But when it comes to the excavation part of uh, field work, there is very little impact, if no impact at all, actually. Uh, if you don't talk about the actual organization of how the, the field work is going, uh, how, how the um, field work is organized, uh, and uh, the workflow of field work, that's uh, actually a great impact uh, with digital tools. I would say that digital tools have brought, brought a, a new or renewed uh, focus on workflows in archaeology, actually. Uh, and when it comes to um, the post-excavation phase, when writing the report, of course, the analysis is, uh, that's where um, uh, digital tools started to be used uh, in, in archaeology when it comes to, the, to, uh, to computers when, with statistics and uh, uh, with uh, uh, databases and with big data and spatial data with the GIS and, and the volumetrics that we have uh, through um, 3D documentation, for example, that gives a, a, a lot of new uh, avenues of uh, analysis. And when it comes to visualization, uh, uh, GIS and 3D uh, uh, models uh, are, of course, also unparalleled. Uh, and when it comes to dissemination of our results, uh, I guess accessibility has uh, become a, a really impacted with um, digital uh, publications, which is also uh, impacting the form of the report, as well as uh, the whole uh, process of creating a, re a report. Uh, also impacting uh, public outreach, uh, which has uh, also transformed uh, quite a, a lot uh, since digital tools uh, came in uh, the picture, which is also uh, um, increasing inclusion, the possibilities of inclusion, at least, uh, when it comes to the dissemination. And um, the last part, the archiving part of an archaeological investigation has also been very much impacted by digital tools. Um, when it comes to digital repositories and infrastructures, uh, they have led to a lot of increased uh, accessibility to, um, to um, uh, archaeological documentation and uh, uh, etc. But also left the undigitized material, the legacy data, behind that what, what's not digitized is really difficult to find. Um, so that's a, that's why there's a plus and a minus. Uh, but today I will uh, focus mainly on uh, field documentation um, based on a study uh, performed in Malmö in uh, 2014 and published, uh, this study was published in 2018. And this is mainly concerning 2D uh, documentation, so documentation and plan. So we're leaving the 3D documentation uh, aside for the moment. And um, so it's a comparison and uh, some sort of evaluation between the analog and the digital tools that we used in this uh, excavation. This ex excavation took place in uh, uh, an area just outside of Malmö with um, Neolithic flint mines. Uh, it's been known for a long time and it's been excavated uh, during uh, many different uh, um, areas of, uh, or, or um, different um, times in archaeological uh, history uh, during the, 19th, uh, the, the, the the 20th century, because um, the excavations here started in the 60s, and the last excavation uh, was in, in, in 2014, which is marked red 
on this uh, um, image here, but this whole area uh, is full of thousands of Neolithic flint mines. And this is uh, actually relevant because these kind of remains are really difficult to document and plan, okay? Um, so that's why this is a good example. Uh, just for your information, these mines, uh, the Neolithic mines were um, used um, from 4000 BC or so in the next couple of hundred years after that. But there are also a lot of other uh, periods uh, that are represented here, later periods are represented here. So during this time, uh, from the 60s and on, uh, these uh, remains have been um, documented during uh, a lot of varying circumstances, of course. Uh, and as I said, uh, they're quite um, complex, and this has led um, to a focus on the documentation in, in plan, in 2D. And the, actually, the whole area is uh, drawn by hand in scale 1 to 50. Um, and as you can see here on the left, which is an example from um, the 90s, um, it's quite um, complex with a lot of pits and cuts um, uh, and soil dumps next to them uh, on top of each other. Uh, and it's a very time consuming um, task to uh, try and figure this out and document it. And this has led to um, uh, some experimentation um, on, uh, about uh, finding, with the aim of finding more efficient ways to, to document this in plan. Um, as we see here, uh, an example uh, from the 80s uh, with the, uh, where they tried to um, stereometrically draw on aerial photography. And another example from the year 2000 with ma magnetic prospecting. And none of these were um, uh, seen as producing uh, a, a planned documentation that was uh, at, at, at even near the quality of hand drawing. So there, they were experiments, but um, it didn't really change the whole uh, idea of how to uh, document. Uh, the mines. So this is uh, um, the workflow uh, from uh, 2014, uh, where we, uh, you can't really see the top there, but I, I mean, it just says Pilbladet, which is the name of this uh, excavation was Pilbladet. Um, and this is the workflow. And um, we continued the experiments um, with the documentation in plan, we, we combined both uh, digital planning, surveying with the GPS and hand drawing and photogrammetry. Uh, and we, we chose to include the hand drawing in this just to be um, com comparable that our uh, little area there should be comparable uh, to the other areas uh, and the earlier documentation. Uh, so, digital recording and hand drawing and uh, photogrammetry uh, in various uh, ways were how we um, uh, thought we could um, approach this. Um, and this is the, the, um, the result of the, uh, it's really, really easy, I mean, you can't see the top there, but mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry, I just uh, need to change something here. Mm. I, I, now I can't. Uh, no, I can't. It's not possible. No. Nah. Um, I'll tell you what it says. So this is the... Um, the, the result of the digital um, planning, surveying with a, a GPS and or, or uh, as it's called the GNSS by the GPS, that's the green uh, and the red is the digitized hand drawings. Okay, so we have uh, two different uh, sets of um, documentation here combined. And the idea was, um, 
to have like different aim, aims uh, with the digital planning and the hand drawing. Okay, so with the digital planning with the GPS, uh, we we um, we planned to only document the outline of the features. Okay, uh, but that got more detailed over time as uh, the. The, the remains were so uh, complex that it was really difficult to know exactly what is the outline and what is just a, a layer within a cut or something. Um, and also at this time, um, it was really difficult to get a, a direct overview of what was already planned uh, because in the uh, hand computer on the GPS, it wasn't possible. The interface wasn't, it didn't give uh, an overview of what was already planned. I guess that's possible today, but this you have to think this is a, a while back, uh, which led to a loss of control during planning. Uh, and we also noticed that the um, interpretation, the initial interpretation that we did when we were planning uh, was forced to sort of follow the logic of the geodatabase, which means that we used polygons, so we had to close the polygon every time. And um, so you, even if you couldn't really see where something, um, some shift uh, would happen, it was really um, difficult to, to end uh, with, with, uh, if it sort of, sort of started to get um, unclear uh, because a polygon has to be closed. Um, and we also recorded relations, what we thought were cutting what, uh, for example, which was possible to say that now what's on the left side is cutting what's on the right side of this line, etc. Um, but we used also we also used predefined categories to be comparable with earlier um, documentation. So predefined categories of how to uh, categorize the soil, how much uh, chalk and how much uh, clay and and so so on. Uh, and when it comes to the hand drawing, the aim was to to fill in the details of um, in what was inside sort of the, the outlines of the features um, and um, it's to, to complement what was already um, documented with the GPS. But this became, of course, less detailed over time as it was already planned with the GPS, okay? Uh, on a contrary, it, to the digital planning, the, the hand drawing, of course, gives you a direct overview of what's been done and what's, what's still to, to draw, uh, because you have it in front of you, of course, and that also gives you flexibility to sort of get to um, uh, to the question marks and the, the, the less uh, certain uh, shifts, etc. It's easier to do in, in the hand drawing. So the combination of these two ways of um, documenting, um, we thought it was uh, a little bit difficult to balance the two. It didn't really work out the way we planned it. Um, uh, and uh, we could uh, conclude that there were, they were two time-consuming methods. Hand drawing has to be digitized before we can uh, see it in, in, uh, in uh, an ArcGIS project, for example. And uh, digital planning was constantly interrupted by these uh, uh, like breaks when we had to go and, and print out something to see what we had done and so on. So that was uh, also time consuming. And also uh, when it comes to uh, time to prepare for this, that wasn't um, actually very, um, um, that, that was uh, actually limited. Time for preparation was limited because Careful cleaning only uh, um, had to happen when it was needed. Uh, so uh, this resulted in uh, a detailed interpretation of the surface before the excavation, including what we from the surface could see as relations and, and sequences. And we could conclude that digital and manual uh, documentation in this case was as detailed and in that way uh, they were comparable methods but when we come to the uh, the the photo, uh, the photo photogrammetry uh, uh, the photographic uh, documentation in this case the photogrammetry we used a simple uh, gopro camera on a pole uh, that was quite easy um, we um, 
so this resulted in uh, uh, photos that were uh, processed in various ways. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details here, but uh, of course it has to be processed. Uh, and uh, this resulted in two outcomes, uh, two different uh, orthophotos uh, combined with the graphical uh, record that I've already uh, shown you, uh, the, the record from digital planning and hand drawing. Uh, so one of them is the photo mosaic that you see here on the left uh, with the individual photos uh, uh, with the uh, uh, hand drawing and, and, uh, and etc on top and on the right here you see uh, homogenized photos uh, that they're homogenized in in uh, photo scan and uh, uh, to be um, more of a, a, a more co coherent um, um, image and um, so I would say that from now on I will call this the combined uh, record or the combined uh, documentation and this is what we actually found very useful during post excavation and the analysis of the finds and, um, and but just a few words of, of this uh, photographic documentation uh, as compared to the two other methods that we used. This was a long time uh, uh, in preparation. It needed a long time for preparation because we had to clean the whole area before it could be photographed. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, acquisition is really quick. You just have to walk uh, in a grid and take the photos from the pole. That's quite quick. Uh, and no advanced uh, technology is needed for this. Uh, and as I said before, this is also this was also very useful during um, during um, uh, the analysis stage, uh, especially the photo mosaic with a high resolution uh, for a detailed uh, analysis of of relations and so on, and the homogenized uh, orthophoto with the low, lower resolution, but, but was very good for an overview, and we used that a lot for the visualizations in figures and and so on, uh, to be very um, 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 illustrative. Uh, also, the scaleness scalelessness of uh, the the ArcGIS uh, is an advantage because it was possible to get really close to the find uh, to to the to the surface of the remains, uh, which was. Um, really helpful in this case um, because um, this, these kind of re, uh, um, really complex remains, when we later did the sections, when we started to do sections here, we realized that it wasn't as uh, we thought from what it looks in one way uh, on top, on the surface, and then we have to reevaluate and re uh, uh, assess and and re um, interpret the, the the relations and so on. What is what uh, when you see it in the section? So it was really um, necessary to see the the both of the uh, impressions from uh, the surface and from the section. Um, so I would say this is uh, in this way. Uh, this kind of a document counteracts what is usually called the, the distance that uh, uh, digital methods are creating. Um, because digital methods are often said to create a distance to the remains. Uh, uh, for example, it's been called a digital wedge or, or other kind of um, 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 uh, wordings. Um, but for us in this case, it was really uh, important that we could see the unexcavated surface after the fact that it was excavated. Um, and it shows the circumstances of this initial interpretation that we had. And like I said, it often changed after we um, excavated. So this gave us a possibility to go back in uh, our own process of interpretation to be more reflexive uh, of this whole um, uh, process of, in, of interpretation. Um, so uh, just to mention that I'm talking about the 2D um, documentation now. Photogrammetry also gives you 3D models, but in this case it wasn't um, um, 
important. It was only used to show a slope, and that wasn't really important for the analysis. The analysis was more um, uh, done on the orthophoto. Uh, so uh, some conclusions when it comes to um, the workflow. Uh, again, this the workflow is is important um, when it comes to planning and and um, the timing uh, of excavations when you have um, digital uh, documentation methods. And these, because it's it's obvious that these various documentation methods, they uh, generate very different processes of decision-making and interpretation. Uh, when it comes to hand drawing and digital mapping, uh, the assessment and the interpretation happens mainly during cleaning and recording when you're there working with the remains. When it comes to the uh, photographic uh, record, the assessment and interpretation happens not so much during a recording as uh, afterwards. It's delayed or postponed, if you like. Uh, and the combined um, uh, documentation, as you, as you see here um, uh, in the in the image, um, it allows uh, reinterpretations, and you could say that it's a, a new point of discovery that we could see other things here um, uh, than we did in, in when we were in the field, some sort of delayed discoveries, if you like. Um, and it changed the spatial uh, relation to the remains because it could create a closeness to the surface rather than the distance uh, that I call that I that I mentioned before. And the scalelessness of it um, was also very useful to be able to go up and down and see, uh, uh, see it uh, in different scales. Uh, it's also changed the temporal relation to the remains uh, as previous phases of our interpretation became available uh, to us uh, in this case. Uh, so you could see it as a, some sort of palimpsest of various phases or layers of, of the process of interpretation, which, which gives a lot of um, uh, transparency. And... Um, the outcome of this little evaluation that we did underlines the importance of careful planning and careful timing when you are doing something like this, because there are different rhythms to the various documentation methods. And I would say that we don't say it, it's not, it's not more efficient uh, when it comes to saving time. Uh, I would say the workload just shifts from uh, one part of the excavation to another. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's not actually that um, money saving uh, um, method uh, as as some may say that it's that that's the argument why you should use uh, digital methods because it's it's um, involving perhaps other people and and it's another uh, work task but um, it still has to be done so I don't think it's time saving um, also, we saw a lot of delays and interruptions in the process of digital documentation. Of course, this was also an experiment. So we 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 also uh, did some ad hoc uh, experiments and so on. So so uh, that's the, and and if you have a lot of delays and interruptions in the documentation, of course, that also creates uh, delays and interruptions in the process of interpretation, which is. Uh, also a disruption, but that can be if you plan carefully and, and uh, take uh, into account the timing of all these different methods, I and mean, you can avoid that, of course. Um, and I would say that preferably a document like this, like this uh, combined uh, uh, document with various kinds of um, uh, uh, documentation in it should be made available immediately during the field work uh, when it's happening because in that case it can impact how you decide uh, make, make decisions and 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 change uh, the way you you um, investigate or something but in this case uh, that wasn't possible um, so i would say it's important to plan for the best flow of interpretation process and not let the technical aspects uh, decide the workflow um, and this kind of um, uh, evaluation or this kind of project can also raise awareness of the material and technical agency in uh, in the archaeological um, interpretation process, because of course the we we uh, adjust to to the machines. I mean that's um, 
something that's all, always been the case, but with digital methods, it's uh, it sometimes maybe uh, taking too much uh, uh, space. And when it comes to the interpretation, um, I would say that in this case, at least, we used this uh, kind of image as a new interface for interpretation, this combined uh, image as an, some sort of new point of discovery, as I, um, so that, that's a, a, a wording that's used by Matt Edgeworth in his, uh, um, from spade work to screen work article, but it's really, I think that's really an, a good uh, way of phrasing it. Um, and I also think that the spatial and, and temporal flexibility in this kind of record can break up the linearity of the process of interpretation, uh, as well as um, uh, document our changes in the, pro in the process of interpretation. And this is a step towards keeping or at least not erasing the uncertainty of the process of interpretation and the ambiguity of the archaeological remains. Uh, so um, analog or digital uh, documentation uh, methods or tools, uh, well, it's, it's not either or, of course, and, and I think that this study offers a rather complex answer to this uh, question. And, and of course, this is again uh, about 2D documentation and we're not talking about the 3D. Uh, but I still, I believe that this question still needs attention. Um, and we are of course not the only ones uh, thinking about um, these kind of um, um, the aspects of digital versus analog. And this is uh, from a study that's uh, quite recently been um, um, published. Actually, it's a preprint, so it's not uh, really published yet, but it's coming out very soon. Bo a body mapping experiment, that's what it says uh, on the top, body mapping experiment. It's uh, uh, an experiment to see how archaeologists uh, perceive and, and um, experience these two different kinds of um, methods to document uh, and the findings uh, that they have um, from this uh, at least preliminary findings from this um, uh, experiment is that the digital uh, has advantages in terms of that data factor and speed and efficiency we recognize that right and ease of access and the feed the feedback and the data sharing and so on and when it comes to the analog um, tools and, and, and methods, has a tangible and sensory aspect that fosters a deeper connection with the archaeological material and um, a sense of control over uh, the, the recorded data. Uh, and this, of course, is echoing some of the uh, debates that has been going on since the start of the uh, of the um, digital methods in archaeology, we recognize that with the, the gain is the efficiency, but the loss, uh, as was uh, how it was um, phrased in the 90s, the, the loss of the record of uncertainty, nuance, and flexibility. Uh, so, can um, digital techniques offer a solution to uh, regain what is perceived as lost then? I yeah, mean, to go sort, sort of full circle here. Um, um, can we, with the digital methods, document the tangible and the sensory aspects, the deep connection, um, the uncertainty of the process and the ambiguity of the remains? Well, um, at least we are trying to. There is a new study um, that combines language studies and uh, digital techniques in archaeology. Uh, uh, there's a pilot study in Estravon, which is an Iron Age site in Blekinge. And we have had two um, uh, excavation seasons in, in 2021 and 2023. Uh, and in this project, uh, we're documenting audiovisually the archaeological discussions happening on site between archaeologists as uh, the uh, actual um, physical movements are also documented. And 
uh, in this project, the key discussions are made uh, searchable by annotations using this, you know, theorem system. I'll uh, explain um, a little bit more about this. Um, so in this process, in this project, um, uh, we are trying to document this interpretative, inter interpretative process as it unfolds when the archaeologists are actually dealing, handling the material, this, this fluid and dynamic uh, relation that is happening, um, including what I talked about, uh, the uncertainty and the ambiguity and so on. So this is done uh, by recording with GoPro cameras um, with um, uh, fastened on the uh, uh, archaeologists uh, and several um, excavators wear them simultaneously. And we have uh, chosen to use a captural um, principle because um, even though it means a lot of data, uh, captural uh, is better um, because if we we also tried to uh, not do the capture uh, uh, but only record what is important, but it's uh, trying to decide what is important and turn the camera on uh, while you're you're already discussing and, and excavating is is it's it's very difficult to get everything recorded that way. Uh, you miss half of it. Um, even in another experiment we did um, actually in, in Turkey at Chatham Hugh with cameras worn by excavators that could record 30 seconds back in time um, because they were recording without recording sort of. So they you could press a button and then capture uh, what was said 30 seconds ago uh, until now, so, so to speak. But it was still very difficult to get all the, the important uh, discussions recorded that way um, so uh, the capture uh, principle is what we decided on in this project and so so this recorded data then uh, all the discussions uh, is annotated and structured uh, in a, a special um, software and can be analyzed uh, so this this sort of captures that whole initial um, um, First of all, the physical engagement, but also what you are talking about, all these different alternatives uh, that, oh, could this be this, could this be that, um, before you sort of define uh, what it is and start watching and cleaning your your data. So, so that's uh, what this uh, project is um, aiming at. So this is the software. It's called Elan. And, and, and you can so, so you so this is like two cameras uh, and you have it is they are um, simultaneous so so if this person looks up you see the other person with the camera and you hear the discussion going on uh, the two microphones and then you use uh, various kinds of uh, annotations okay here they start talking about a certain layer okay so this is uh, something that's happening so that uh, gets classified uh, uh, using certain uh, uh, classifications from uh, what's called the CDOC CRM, which is, uh, okay, so CDOC CRM, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, yeah, so it's um, uh, an official ontology that uh, can help archeologists uh, classify and order structure data. And it's something that is, um, actually been it's been used uh, uh, worldwide this this kind of classification um, and some of the questions uh, that we uh, are uh, discussing in this project um, is of course this this initial part of uh, the implementation process, this initial part, or, or this um, um, limited part of the uh, ex, uh, the interpretation process happening during excavation. It's just one part in the long process of uh, uh, the process of interpretation that happens to an archaeological material. And so 
should the rest be added? Should we also add uh, discussions, for example, when the archaeologists receive analysis uh, results from different uh, labs, for example, when the datings are coming in or when various kind of results from other um, uh, kinds of all, all kinds of extra uh, information is coming in and changing the, the, the uh, in interpretations. Should that also be added? And, and where do you draw the line there? I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a, something to be discussed. Um, also, I'm writing the social position of the excavator here um, because um, not in this project, because this project is like a smaller group of peers uh, doing the excavation. So it's, it's not a large project with a, a complicated hierarchy, uh, etc. But the other project I was talking about uh, with the cameras, um, uh, the issue came up there uh, that this was some sort of um, a risk of being perceived as surveillance or some sort of um, in, yeah um, control uh, uh, from um, the management of the project, let's say. Uh, so uh, that's also an, something to keep in mind uh, when you do things like this. Uh, also, um, you can just imagine if you have an excavation going on for a couple of weeks or, or months even, and uh, how much do you actually record? And at what point do you report, do you record or do you record all of it, uh, the whole excavation, then you are left with enormous amounts of data. Um, I mean, just uh, filming a few days gives you enormous amounts of data. And um, it's really difficult to sort of, before it's an annotated, it's, it's just uh, uh, reliving the whole excavation again, if you look at it. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's uh, also a loss of a uh, risk of loss of in of overview here, um, and also, of course, the annotation process takes a lot of time, uh, especially when you go through this the whole uh, process and, and annotating it manually and using these uh, different uh, classes and saying what it is. So, of course, uh, some sort of algorithm will have to. Uh, could be at least some sort of solution. But then if you use an algorithm, I mean, what kind of, what do you lose then? If you don't uh, think of all various kinds of uh, situations uh, that you have to teach the algorithm, but then what you, what you miss there, then you will miss that in the record, right? And, and also, also the, the CIDOC CRM is of course something um, that is world used worldwide and it's also very uh, general in a way. So that also is a little bit of a loss of flexibility there. Uh, and there's also a question, who will reuse this? Who will use this kind of material? Who is going to use it in the future? Because we are thinking this can be used by archeologists in 20 years time. If they want to go back and see exactly um, if they are excavating nearby, they want to know exactly what, what did the post holes look uh, when they actually first found them. Uh, because we think now that the post holes look another way and maybe they have something to draw about. So, but, but I mean, you have to imagine who will use it to, um, to be able to sort of facilitate that use, right? Um, and when it comes to reuse, I just, um, want to go back to what I mentioned before, the um, uh, the FAIR principles. Um, at Pilbladet, the uh, flint mine place, um, we adjusted our documentation to be comparable um, because we did the, 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 the hand drawing in the scale of 1 to, to 50, uh, just to um, be comparable with the other previously done documentation that was um, um, uh, uh, from all the different um, um, excavations that had taken place there. Um, so we were aiming at the interoperability and reusability or comparability and reusability, uh, the, the last two uh, letters in the FAIR uh, principles. 
fair is the findability, availability, interoperability, and reusability. Um, but the question is, how much legacy data is really reused? And when I say reused, I mean it's actually reanalyzed and reinterpreted. It's because some people are actually questioning this, if there is any, uh, if there is much re reuse at all. Uh, Jeremy Huggett being one of them, um, talking about, uh, and and this is of course when you don't uh, use the interpretation of uh, because people are always using other people's interpretations, but this, we're talking here about actual reinterpretations. Uh, okay, so um, um, actually we're talking about uh, the CAA conference, uh, the Computer Application in Archaeology um, uh, conference that uh, was uh, six months ago or something. Uh, I went to a uh, session there that was about to reuse the R in FAIR, uh, a session on reuse, and there was a lot of uh, presentations about reuse. However, most of them seemed to mean that uh, they were making their data available, and, and not many of these presentations were on actual reuse, um, because availability does not automatically mean that it's being reused. It doesn't always lead to reuse. Uh, so um, I think uh, it's important um, to have in mind who will reuse your documentation and for what when you start planning uh, your um, uh, documentation, because how, um, how how this data is created is also giving some sort of limitations and possibilities how it uh, can be reused and for what. Uh, so I think that has to be taken into account. Uh, all right, so um, some questions and consequences of digital methods in archaeology. It's been suggested that uh, digital methods are just mimicking earlier analog uh, methods. And of course, we have seen some of uh, uh, that here today. Some uh, are very similar and having the same aim, et cetera. And that can be seen, uh, this uh, mimicking can be seen as good or bad. Uh, for example, Delunto and Taylor are talking about this, the emulation or skeuomorph uh, skeuomorphic practice as a socialized practice, which enables uh, incorporation of new methods in current practices. I mean, if, if you uh, recognize what you're doing uh, with the new methods, then that will also give you the opportunity to uh, incorporate them and, in, and eventually lead to more innovative um, uses of these methods. On the other hand, uh, Morgan, Colleen Morgan is saying that uh, she's questioning whether this mimicking uh, is in, if, if it's not inhibiting the innovative and transformative practices that are uh, needed to go forward in, in our documentation practices. So there are different uh, ideas of um, how this uh, uh, mimicking um, place in, in our in practice. But uh, you could also say that the, the digital methods give the possibility to break up the linear processes of documentation and interpretation. This is said by Carragher, and you can also say that uh, our uh, combined uh, documentation at Pil Blood at the mining place uh, with layers of interpretation uh, also enables the spatial and temporal flexibility, which also means that it can uh, break up this linearity. Um, at Pilblodet, we adjusted uh, the um, methods according to the remains, and I think that's also something that is really important, that you don't have a one size fits all kind of uh, documentation system, but you always have to look at what you are going to document. Uh, uh, also, uh, at Home, we are just at the beginning of exploring the potential of all these digital methods uh, put together. Um, but what can be said that it's uh, these uh, methods have 
It has a great impact on our workflow in the field. Uh, the processes of uh, documentation and interpretation are very much impacted, and we are only in the beginning of understanding how. Thank you.